Maybe I'm better off losing the debate. I'll, I'll make sure he says I'll lose the debate on purpose. Maybe I'll do something like that. I assume he's going to be uh, somebody that will be a worthy debater. Should I be tough and nasty and just say you're the worst president in history? Or should I be nice and calm and let him speak? Welcome to episode 88 of The Middle Unplugged, a break in the middle of the week when we push off on the left and the right and reclaim the microphone and have a little sane, level-headed conversation, perhaps a little bit of a break from what you get perhaps elsewhere, even on the Red Apple Podcast Network. So you heard in that opening, there's a lot of different ways that Donald Trump is trying to raise lower expectations. That kind of is common before debates. But tomorrow in Atlanta, they are going to sit down. Well, no, they're going to stand up. Turned out that all that talk about sitting down was completely fabricated. And there's a lot of talk about, well, what does it all mean? Let me just start out with some general observations. And then we're going to have an interview and a conversation with someone who might bring a different perspective. And we're going to try to break it down a little bit differently than you might normally expect one of these shows to go. First, let me just say, I'm sitting here and recording the day before. There's a pretty good chance Donald Trump doesn't show up. Remember, he hasn't had debates since 2016, didn't have them in 2020. He was the incumbent, hasn't had them all the way along here, avoided them assiduously. Um, I don't think he particularly is crazy about having them. Uh, and I think that he kind of sees that he got kind of boxed in a little bit to this one with his own rhetoric of any time, any place, et cetera. And that Joe Biden has seized the, um, seized the kind of the narrative to a bit. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Donald Trump's a little afraid of what might happen here. Um, second thing I would say is that, look, there is a great deal at stake. And we're going to talk about this a little bit when I talk to our guests, there's a great deal at stake here that might not normally be at stake because of the timing of this thing happening so early. Uh, I'm not surprised at all at the expectation jiggering that's going on by the Trump campaign. I think they're not quite sure what to expect from their own guy and nor what um, he himself expects. What we decided to do this time in our conversation was to take some of the things that the partisans on both sides are saying to their own candidate by way of advice and dissect that advice a little bit. And I'm going to be doing it um, with Charlie King. Charlie King uh, was the former head of the Democratic Party here in New York, the executive director. He ran for lieutenant governor with Andrew Cuomo once upon a time, ran for attorney general. He's now a lobbyist slash political consultant slash guy who kind of gives advice to candidates. I've known him for a, um, a, a long time. I consider him a friend, and he's always brings interesting things to the table here. We're going to have a conversation about the debate, and perhaps towards the end I'll be able to maybe know Nudge him to give us some of his views as an African American consultant about, and former candidate himself, about what's going on with the African American vote. Um, I think you'll enjoy the conversation. So here is me and Charlie King doing a debate preview. So, welcome, Charlie King. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I wanted to tell you that uh, I love your show, Left Versus Right. Uh, Dominic gets the better of you, but uh, I'm glad that you have the chutzpah to bring on someone who can uh, bust your chops a little bit. But, you know, here's the thing, and this is a real thing. Almost un unanimously, people who comment online about it, they say the show is simply unlistenable or unintelligible because we're shouting over each other nonstop. Yet... Dominic says, and the folks at WABC says, no, it's great. People are, are tuning in, in in good numbers. People like it. What is your take? Should we just let each other finish our thoughts? Well, you Sorry to interrupt actually... you, Charlie. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Go yeah, ahead. <laughs> there we go. No, that, that's exactly the way you're doing the show uh, as well. And uh, I want to just let you know and other people know I was Dominic Carter for you before Dominic Carter came on. And I know that you sort of upped your show and upped your game. Uh, but uh, I do think it's a little bit like a train wreck. I mean, you can't, uh, <laughs> you, can't you, know, you want to look away, but you can't. Uh, so uh, it is interesting to see you in a tie. Uh, so I like that. That's you know, a new, that's, that's time, a new so. innovation. So that let, is let's... a new innovation. So uh, no, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I do want to say that, uh, you know, I, maybe a little less shouting, um, but Agreed. you do, you are deferential to Dominic as you should be. Agreed. We have to do less shouting. So here's what I wanted you on today. Tomorrow is the first presidential debate. And the way I thought we'd structure this, just to have a little more fun with it, is you cannot shake a dead cat without hitting someone who is doing a, de a debate preview show of some sort. So much so that I thought we would take an example of a debate advice kind of preview thing from the right 
one from the left and see if we think that between the two of them, they may be getting it right in terms of what kind of advice we would give to the two candidates. So that's the conceit who shake, of our- who shakes, a, who shakes a dead cat? Yeah, I don't know where I got that expression from. But Yeah, I don't know either, but keep I have going. To be, this one. I have to be careful. Curtis Lee was into animal rights. I don't want him to pick it at my house. Um, but before we start that, we're going to take someone, we're going to take the, the uh, Mother Jones, the far left organization that that is, David Korn, who's, uh, who's a, a lefty guy there, wrote an essay. And then the New York Post editorial page wrote their essay, Korn giving advice to Biden, Post giving advice to Trump. And I think we should give it a little bit of a grade and a, maybe a little bit of talking back to it. You have this experience as I, as I introduced you. You've run for office. You've advised other candidates. Before we begin that, what do you think of the idea of having this debate so early in the cycle? What, what impact do you think it'll have? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I don't know that it will have that much of an impact because it is so far out. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there is an opportunity for both candidates to, to shore up a lot of misgivings that they both have. I mean, you've got a lot of folks who are for double haters who have misgivings about each. So there is an opportunity for, you know, this early on to sort of pick up some points uh, if they are, uh, if they can make a, a strong impact in this debate. So on the one hand, usually these debates are, you know, this far out might have zero effect, but given that both have so far to go in, sort of, in terms of gaining support, it, it could be more meaningful than usual. Yeah, I mean, my my view, is that the I think the reason Biden wanted it is the idea of you know having more time to make hay, having those undecided voters have something to look at sooner. Usually, as I've pointed out on my show, usually by the time these debates happen, people have already chosen sides. Like there aren't as regardless of what happens, there aren't many persuadables left. So it'll be interesting to see if if um, if 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 this captures some people before they're used to making decision. I don't know about your view of this. My view is that people who are supporting Trump are not moving to Biden and people who are supporting Biden are not moving to Trump, that the people who are we're all arguing over are low information voters somewhere in the middle that don't pay that much attention. I don't know if you disagree with that. Um, I don't know that I fully uh, agree with you on that. I think that there are I think there are some people, frankly, <clears throat> who, if given the reason to support Trump, they would. Um, and they are not necessarily low information voters. They are very frustrated um, with, and not necessarily fairly, um, but they're very frustrated with the way things are. And they're in, in a weird way, they're willing to give, and we'll get into this when we talk about it, but they're willing to give Trump a second look um, uh, but they but they want to hear a little bit more like they're very disgusted with kind of who he is but some of his politics or sort of the framing of the issues they're interested in uh in a way that that biden and democrats have not been able to capture them thus far yeah well that's um, a so good they want to know more. point I, i'd like to get your view maybe after we do a little bit about the debate talk specifically about african-american democrats and what seems to be going on with them. But let's jump into this notion of debate a little bit. And let's start with the advice for Joe Biden being given by David Korn of Mother Jones. And he basically starts out by saying, these are the four things that Joe Biden has to accomplish in his debate. One, he needs to champion his time in office, meaning basically refresh everyone on the things that he's done. Two, share a compelling vision for a second term, what he plans to do. These are kind of the baseline things that all candidates have to do who are incumbents. Then he says he's got to do these two other things. One is to defend himself against the, the thrust against him that he's too old, basically. And the final thing is he has to attack Trump for being a threat to democracy. Do you think that those four legs kind of summarize what Joe Biden has to accomplish in this? And then I want to go into the little tweak that he has on all four of them. What do you think about that four-legged kind of uh, pillars of the debate uh, um, strategy for, for Biden? Well, I think, yes, with a caveat. And he, he said, from what I read, some things a little bit, I, you know, I took what he wrote a little bit differently, which maybe we can get into. 
But I think the danger for him are points one and two. If he's just, you know, here's what I've done, um, and it just, your eyes glaze over, that to me is the trap. Um, Because he's done a lot of good things while in office, and it's just not resonating. I think where Trump has an advantage is that there are a lot of Democrats where he said, you know, I've done these things, or I will do these things for you. I will get you better paying jobs, period, full stop. And he just, whether it's true or not, he says it, people believe it. He actually, he will go for your heart, whereas Biden may go for your mind. Um, And the heart to me is what is going to generate people to come to the polls. So one and two, to your point of what David Korn, as you describe it, I think inaccurately, but that's not the first time for you, uh, are the danger zones for for Biden. I think uh, three and four uh, make sense. So you so you're saying that that basically give up on the idea of selling people on Bidenomics, assume that that's not going to work very well and just kind of proceed to the other things. I'm not old and he's a bad guy, basically. Well, I think that there are ways that you have to package it. And I think that's where David Korn was getting at. Um, So, for example, on infrastructure, you can't just recite you know, I've, you know, I've done all these things, look at all of this. I mean, I think Hillary Clinton, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, thinks she's tremendous. I think even if you, uh, you know, if you read what she talks about in terms of how to prepare for the debate, the way she recites the, the facts of accomplishment, to me, sort of plays into sort of the disadvantage that Democrats have, because it's, it's very intellectual in the approach. It's a, very compelling argument for intellectually, but emotionally, it it doesn't get us there. Um, and I think that that's the challenge. I think what what Corn was saying is that you have to package those accomplishments in, almost in a Trumpian way. And I think that that is the, the sort of the secret sauce for how Biden. Now, whether he can pull it off or not um, remains to be seen. But I think that that's where Biden can be successful. Well, that's what that's that's the the next thing he kind of says, we need to do these four things. And now I'm going to get into the basically the nut of what he says the approach should be. And the approach he argues is a short version of it is try to get under Trump's skin, try to deride him a little bit with the things you said, you know, like he says in 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 some examples that he says uh, that he says, hey, Mr. Master Builder, how many infrastructure weeks did you have with which nothing happened? It was it. Uh, it was a fake reality show. I passed a trillion dollar infrastructure spending. How much did you do? Like basically, try to appeal to our, our, I guess, our shared understanding of how easy it is to throw Trump off his game, and it's kind of a cute way of doing the two things. What do you think about the idea that a lot of voters, a lot of citizens, who are going to be tuning in to basically see the like you said about me and Dominic Carter, to see if Donald Donald Trump kind of goes off the rails in some way. Do you think that's a strategy or do you think that that kind of dishonors the importance of the issues here? Well, both. Uh, it does dishonor um, the issues in a way, but it's also a winning strategy. Um, I think that's the only way you can deal with uh, with with Trump because he's going to he's going to turn the entire process on its head anyway. Uh, so you have to be prepared for it. Um, you can't come in and be buttoned up and look all presidential when Trump is going to be, you know, throwing mud and uh, violating all of the rules of etiquette and scoring points left and right while you're standing stoic and presidential. It's but that a, didn't, it, but, to me, but that's Charlie, a, did that happen in 2020? In Cleveland in 2020, it was almost uniformly agreed upon that Donald Trump lost that debate because he looked like he was unhinged and Joe Biden looked like an adult. Yeah, I think that that's right. But I think this time the stakes are different. Um, And I think that, you know, Biden's been here for four years and he's running against, first of all, a convicted felon who is still neck and neck with him. Right. Um, And that that his posture is not winning convincingly or even at all. Um, And he has to throw Trump off his game or other people are going to give Trump a second look. Um, And I think people are doing that already. 
So that's where I that's that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, look, there there is an argument to be made for the idea that what moderate independent voters want is a certain vision of what a president should be. Remember, in 2020, undecideds broke late about 60-40 for Joe Biden. And a lot of it was just around the idea of we don't want drama anymore. We want kind of competence and everything else. And this was the drama of COVID and the drama, just Trump being Trump. Um, but there is this compelling argument. If you want to make Joe Biden, make Donald Trump crazy, one way to do it is to call him a loser on the debate stage. I give another example for our listeners of what David Korn thinks, how you should talk about these issues. Um, um uh, why can't you take credit for the one thing, the one big thing you did during the COVID pandemic, encourage the quick development of the COVID vaccine? Are you afraid of all the anti-vaxxers out there? Like basically put him on the horns of this tough thing. Which side are you on when it comes to all of this stuff? Or his idea of asking about the January 6th rioters. On January 6th, while rioters attacked the Capitol, you sat there, you did nothing and watched television. We're all curious. What did you have for lunch that day? Um, this is clever. I can't see Joe Biden doing any of this, can you? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if he can do it well. Uh, and I think that that's the, that's the big question. But I think, you know, I think what a lot of us are yearning for from Biden and from the Democratic Party is the ability to, to punch back. I mean, when you're in the middle of a fight, uh, you, you need to fight. Um, and so, that is um, something that I think is important. And I do think that it does get under um, Donald Trump's skin and, and makes him look crazier. And to your point, uh, that in the long run will send people back home to Biden. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough balancing act because on one hand, you do want to get Donald Trump thrown off his game. But on the other hand, you don't want Joe Biden to lose track of what his knitting is like his he is an adult and he acts, you know, um, before we move off of Joe Biden, I'm going to bounce a theory off you that is probably not new, but it's one that I have, have embraced. But the problem that Joe Biden has is not what he says, but how he says it, that he the his age is revealed itself in the weakness of his timber, of his voice. And when he does his best at the State of the Unions and other places, it's when he's kind of yelling. Um, otherwise, he sounds like he's mumbling. You've got a lot of expertise in preparing candidates for debates like this. You're not likely to yell when you're not in front of an audience, when you're in a studio, when you have a microphone in front of you. Or I have some concern that Joe Biden is going to be mumbles the entire time. What about you? Well, <clears throat> I think... I think that there's always that concern with anybody. I mean, you were a terrible debater. Um, and, uh, you know, that's because uh, you never asked me to help you. Uh, but that's for another podcast for another day. Um, but but with Biden, I think that he will become animated when attacked. I mean, I don't think that, um, you know, I think <clears throat> with Trump coming at him, he will be ready for the fight. So I'm le actually less concerned about uh, about Biden being mumbles this time around. Um, I think he will be animated, awake, and sharp. Do you think, I guess this is in the realm of, you can also make, you can tell you what you think he should do, but do you think that we'll hear Joe Biden refer to convicted felon Donald Trump, or do you think that he'll just assume that body of information is out there, voters know it? How do you think there's been a lot of conversation inside Democratic circles about whether to use that phrasing? Do you think he will, and do you think he should? I think he should, and I think he will. Um, you know, A, it's a fact. B, I think it probably gets under Trump's skin. And C, um, because it gets under Trump's skin and it's a fact, Trump has to deal with it. Um, and it has an effect on some of the key voters uh, who are going to, who are undecided and who are making a determination and probably are leaning Biden's way because he's a convicted felon. Yeah, I, I kind of go back and forth on it. On one hand, I think it's knowledge that is already in evidence and people already know it. But I do think just the phrasing might get independent voters. You know, we've seen this modest bump that Trump has that Biden has gotten since the conviction. Just the idea of hearing it in your head 
And knowing for four years this is the way it's going to be referred and this is the conversation we're going to have, it probably has some value. Um, but let's now switch over to the other side of the coin, Donald Trump. Neither one of us are Republicans. Neither one of us probably will be in a position to give advice. But you work for a, a, a firm that does deal with both sides of the aisle and deals with many of these issues. This is the New York Post editorial page. And I found it fascinating, the advice they were giving to Donald Trump. And essentially, it's shut up. It's let Biden talk. Let the debate be about Biden and the things he's saying or not saying. Let him stumble over his own tongue. In a weird way, both David Korn and the New York Post seem to be acknowledging that Donald Trump could be his own worst enemy in this debate. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, um, I do. I think, you know, uh, it, it, Trump, if, if it's all, if, if the debate is all about Trump, um, he becomes his own worst enemy. I think that if Biden is forced to sort of defend Biden or, you know, going back to points one and two and where if to if Trump is not animated, going back to your concern about mumbles, then he can be mumbles. And then that people are like, well, we don't we don't want that. We want somebody uh, who, you know, as Bill Clinton once said, better to be strong and wrong than weak and right. Um, and, you know, Biden, if Biden comes across as weak and right, a lot of people will go with with Trump, who's strong and wrong, provided that he just, to your point, shuts up and lets Biden prove the case that he may be weak and right. Yeah, it's fascinating to listen or to read, rather, the New York Post talk about this. Um, I think they, you know, another thing that they stress is don't think about Donald Trump think about what the voters want. This is something we always talk about when we're giving advice to candidates. Remember, you're not talking about yourself. You know, one of my pet peeves is when you say to someone who's running for office, you say, why are you running for office? And the first five things out of their mouth are something about themselves. I've always wanted to. I feel I've got this experience or that experience. I always tell a prospective candidate, says, listen, your first answer should be what it would mean to that voter to have a different type of leadership. But one of the things that the New York Post writes here Ask yourself again, what do independent voters want? This is them giving advice to Donald Trump. I think that's very good advice because one of the things that Donald Trump is famous for is all talking all about him and his grievances and his beefs and his things. Um, I think if Donald Trump stood up and really seemed to be talking about what the voters need, I think we would be so shocked and jarred by that. Even many Democrats might give him a second look. But my question for you is, does Donald Trump have that temperament? Does he have the ability to follow that instruction? You know, I don't think he does. I mean, I think that in, in large measure, he's gotten to where he is by not following that advice. So, you know, when you've gotten as far as he's gotten, which is he was president of the United States, uh, he will follow he will follow the path that got him there in the first place. Um, and so I think he will come in with bluster. He will come in being who he is and basically playing to his base. And, um, you know, I think he's going to follow that path. And so sounds like an unsuccessful debate for Trump, if that's what he does. I mean, there's only so much. I mean, this is the, the challenge that I have on conservative radio, making people understand only about 35 percent of the country likes the guy. And that's a lot of votes you're leaving on the table. If you're going to have that posture, I'm going to nail down the heels. As a matter of fact, the New York Post talks about this um, a, a lot. You know, they say um, they don't want uh, voters don't want vows of retribution or prosecuting Joe Biden or ripping apart the legal system. This is the New York Post talking to Donald Trump. They, I think, recognize that's not a winning strategy. Yeah, no, I think that's right. But I do think that what he does do is that he can stumble upon uh, issues he either stumbles upon it or there's an evil genius to him that resonates with voters. I'll give you two if he were, you know, one was uh, when he was president, he pardoned uh, Alice Johnson, who was, you know, serving a life term for distributing, you know, uh, cocaine. Uh, and, uh, you know, African-American woman pardoned her. She got out of jail after serving 21 years. Uh, for many people who have gone through the criminal justice system or dealt with the criminal justice system, people in the African-American community, you know, 
for him to just with a stroke of a pen to do that and then say, you know, no president has done that. No one dealt with criminal justice like I have. Your party is a disgrace on this. It will resonate with people who've been affected by the criminal justice system because no one's done it. Like, that's a simple thing. On, you know, immigration, you know, he can say, you know, to Biden, you know, you've adopted my... So whether he stumbles on it or not, like, these are things where he can just hit hard on something that will emotionally attach to voters and go, you know, well, this guy's got a point. Like, why do Democrats not do this? Or why do they adopt his policies? And these are the reasons why we're giving Trump a look anyway, um, because he will do these things that actually make a difference. And Democrats may say the right things, but do they really follow through in the way we want them to all the time? Right. So, I mean, this gets us this gets us back to the very first thing we talked about is whether or not this is an issue based debate or an issue based conversation. One thing that I think that is puzzling, and then I want to use this as a jumping off point to talk about the African-American vote today. One of the things that's public that's puzzling is if you look at the polls, we're in a change election again. It's amazing to me that it used to be change elections came every 20, 30 years or so. Now it's basically every four years we want to throw the bums out. Elected officials of all stripes are unpopular with the voters here in New York. We see it all over. We basically see it. Um, what do you think is going on with this? Is this a function of our social media environment that we just are bitchy and moany about things? Is it that we just don't have good aspirational elected officials at this particular moment? It does seem to be that when you look at the difference in 2020 and 2024, we want to change in 2020. And now it looks like Biden is a victim of the idea that we want change again. How do you explain this? You know, I think it's a combination of things. I think that you do have um, a more <clears throat> excitable base on on both ends of the, the spectrum that are, you know, that are that are more active, um, that are ginning up the conversations, um, which, you know, depending on your perspective is either good or bad. Um, I think that people are uh, are frustrated with status quo. Um, and I think that that uh, change agents are pointing out that the status quo um, is no longer acceptable. And I think that that's, that's part of what is making the difference now. Um, uh, and if you are <clears throat> constantly defending the status quo with pat answers, I think it puts you in a very difficult situation. And I think that that's what happens, like, you know, uh, in a lot of elections these days. Charlie, we're, we're only three years away removed from millions of Americans dying. What the heck? How much reminder do we need that we're better off than we were? We, I mean, we, it's not like 20 <clears throat> years ago we had Donald Trump saying drink bleach and saying both sides are fine and getting impeached twice. It's three freaking years ago. How often? I mean, what do we have? No institutional memory in this world? Yeah, but I mean, you know, I, look, I'm not a... As you know, I'm not a, advocating for Donald Trump, but, you know, there's also a lot of other things where people say, yeah, he was saying drink bleach on that. But he, they will also say that, you know, fundamentally on everyday life, <clears throat> have things really fundamentally changed in a way that you can sit there and say, my life is so much better. Has well, I guess crime, that's fair. Right. So has crime really has crime really dissipated? What are you really doing about the migrant issue? Um, how well, are you crime, really, wait a minute, hold on. Dominic, crime, Dominic took, Tom, crime Dominic has took dissipated. Between, Literally, town cities were on fire under Donald Trump. Well, no, I mean, and what he would say is that the cities are run by Democratic mayors. And so, like, what are you doing to change that? That's not, you know, that's not, that's, that's his All argument. Right. I'm not defending it. it that, this you. is what he would say, right? Well, so, me, and his, his point is, is that these things, like, status quo doesn't hasn't changed anything and he is a radical change agent and if you're if you want the same crap all the time then you should stick with sleepy joe and that's like you know that's i guess that's point. right i mean listen there is right? no one yeah i guess that's right there's no one changier than donald trump if you are in a change environment it is just remarkable to me that we're in a change election here 
right after we got done with one that we said we don't want that. And now we're going to back to that, perhaps. But let me ask you a, 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 about a slice of the electorate. I'm not just asking this because you're an African-American man. I'm asking because you're one of the smartest guys I know. It gives you a sense of how little I go out. But to, to, Probably the smartest man probably. you know, but that's okay. So if you look at the places that the polls have changed since 2020, you know, they say that past indicate past results are not indication of future results. Well, in politics, they usually are. If you have a rematch of a race, you have some sense of where voters are going to be with the different candidates. But there, there are a couple of communities that have, according to the pool, polls move. Older white voters are now voting for Joe Biden, interestingly. Um, we see veterans, for example, tacking towards Joe Biden. But younger voters, let's put those aside because of what's going on. First of all, they're a relatively small number, but also what's going on with Gaza. But African-American voters, both young and old, seem to be, at least now in the polls, in the neighborhood of about 20 percent voting for, for Donald Trump. And for our listeners to understand, it was about 9 percent on Election Day 2020. Is this a real thing? Or is this just frustration in that community is particularly acute because of, uh, because of whatever? What do you think is going on with the black vote and Donald Trump right now? Look, I think when you begin to look at America and the kind of change that is taking place, this is now 2024, um, and African-Americans hear all the time, like, you know, how much progress is being made. And, you know, the reality is, is that some progress is being made, but it's like this, this incremental change. Everything is constantly under attack and, you know, progress isn't happening fast enough for people, for African-Americans younger to feel it on the ground and older people to say, this is making a profound difference where I can, where I, you know, and so, and I go back to the Alice uh, Johnson uh, example, by the way, Barack Obama had an, huge fan of Barack Obama, so I'm not trying to be critical, had the opportunity to pardon uh, Alice Johnson also and didn't, and right? 25, and and so, 2,500 other people at the end. Right. And so, but this is the kind, so this is the kind of, you know, the frustration is like, well, Trump will do things to completely, you know, change like what he, like broken systems that African-Americans see. So it's kind of like, screw screw incremental change this game this guy might not like me as a as an african american but i don't need him to like me i just need the entire structure to change so that i actually have a real opportunity even if it's under a guy who i think is racist because right. this benign this benign effort just isn't getting me anything in a meaningful way yeah that's what i think is going on now i know you're always yeah 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 African Americans are going to come home because that's what you always say, and you're partially right. Um, but I'm not so sure this time. Um, I think the messaging has to be a lot sharper, and the outreach has to be much more real about real gain going forward. Yeah, no, I think it's it's it, it makes a lot of sense. Let's keep in mind though, we're talking a 10 percent difference. That's all. We're not talking about a 50 percent difference. And my 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 view of it is comes back to uh, to immigration. I think African Americans have a sense that immigration, undocumented people jumping over them in line. I think there's, I think that that's, it's a cross, it's an issue that cuts across. I think Hispanic voters also respond to immigration as an issue because they feel the same way. I followed the rules. These people are not. Um, I think at the end of it, I mean, you put a lot of stock in the first step back. Donald Trump has spent five, four and a half years since basically saying every racist thing under the sun, bringing rappers on stage and like, whatever. Yeah, but, I, I don't but, happen but to here, believe. But here's an, important, here's an important point. A lot of African-Americans feel that a lot of people who are white, Trump or someone who they work with, um, have some racist quality. So it's sometimes it's not about what, what pe whether people are racist or not. It's like, how far can, you know, what can I, how can I, uh, how can I, progress how can i succeed in a in a world where i feel most of the most of the world is against me in some form or another so that's sort of the viewpoint so it's like it doesn't matter what he says it's like can i can i create generational wealth so it's more than even right. just can i get a job but can i create generational wealth 
a lot of a lot of African Americans who you know feel it's very difficult to create generational wealth under a democratic approach. Now that might not be right or wrong, but that is the perception. And Trump plays to that. He's like, listen, you know, if you're an, if you're a successful African American business person under my you know under my policies, you'll do a lot better. I might not like you as a person. You might not be able to come into my country club. But you'll be a hell of a lot wealthier right. and you can do what you want with your money. I think I think what it comes down to, in my view, is this notion of change, is that people are not thinking on an, acad- on an academic or intellectual level. They say this guy, Trump, pisses off the white establishment. This guy, Trump, speak, you know, is, is vulgar. This guy, Trump, is a change guy. I want change because my me and my community and my my life needs uh, that kind of change. And I think what the Republicans say about Democrats is not unfair that there has been a long-term gradual kind of taking of grant, taking grant, taking for granted that has been sensed in the community that, you you know, I, I always say to people, you know, feelings are not facts, but you can't ignore feelings. People do have that sense. Um, but let can So if, just, I can, if I can just interrupt for yeah. a second for your listeners, you basically embraced my point from very, at the very beginning when I said hearts over mind is really That's what right. matters. Right. So but I just I wanted everybody- long enough. So it sounds yeah. now the final thing they'll remember is, oh, Wiener is like really smart. He said that thing that I think Charlie said. Yeah, but I wanted to make sure everybody understood <laughs> that it was my point originally and that Wiener embraced it. So before Go we ahead, wrap up. Go ahead, you can up, continue now. Yeah. Before we wrap up, thank you for putting me in my place. Before we wrap up, what do you predict tomorrow night or Friday morning the headline will be? Uh, give us a share. Will it be not much changed? Will it see Trump loses his marbles? Will it see Joe Biden fell over in the middle of a sentence? What do you think of the, the likeliest headline will be? I think it's going to be Biden holds his own uh, despite, uh, you know, uh, but despite Trump assault. That's good. Here's what my thing is. Irrespective of the results, there is not a second debate. How about that for a prediction? That's a terrible prediction. Really? Oh, I I am still not 100% sure Donald Trump shows up. You know, we're recording this early. I'm not 100% sure he shows up. But think about the different scenarios. Donald Trump gets his butt kicked. Then he backs out. He's never been a big fan of debates. He's been ducking debates ever since he's came out of the scene. Joe Biden gets his butt kicked, and then he doesn't want to do it anymore. I mean, I just think that... Oh, I think you might be right. I just don't think that's going to be the headline, was my point. Got it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Charlie King, I thank you so much, both for your friendship and for your service to our state and to our country. You've given us a lot of great perspective to think about. I know I have. Thank you. (laughs) So I hope you enjoyed that. I found it interesting. A lot of things we're only going to find out about tomorrow on the debate stage. We'll see who's right about what the headline will turn out to be. And we'll obviously have to wait to November to find out what goes on with the African-American vote. I want to thank Charlie King for joining us. And um, when we come back... Ask Anthony anything. So we'll go back to Ask Anthony every every. Yeah, why do we do that one year? Ask Anthony everything. Now, why don't we just this week just do another episode of Ask Anthony anything? Um, this week, I want to focus on this not twisting that's going on within the Republican Party about that issue I like talking about, and apparently, according to the polls, a lot of people are concerned about, and definitely something we'll see in the debate tomorrow night, and that's immigration. So just to reset the table again for you, there is a real problem in our country around the laws that dictate asylum. Asylum is when you come here and you basically said, I won't be safe if I go back. It's one of the bedrock elements of our immigration um, program. You have to show that you're here for fear of a credible risk if you go home. The process for coming here as an, as an asylee and, and, and successfully declaring asylum are relatively difficult. But over the course of now decades, because the programs that we've had to have people come in in a more orderly way for economic reasons, more and more and more people have realized the only way that they can come in and be permitted to stay even for a short period of time is through the asylum laws. And so they, lo- they have learned or now understand that to declare asylum and be here lawfully while you're waiting for your case to be adjudicated requires you just being in the United States and saying, I want asylum. At that point, you are here lawfully, and you get to return to have a hearing before a judge to see if you're allowed to stay. 
But the problem with the system today is that because so many people now recognize that's their only path to coming in, they're sneaking in. Once they're here, they declare as they go wait online to appear before a, uh, a border officer or they show up at a crossing and they say, I'm here to declare asylum. And then they are basically free to go into the United States while they wait for their hearing. But because there are so many of them, and because of the resources to have those hearings are so stretched, <clears throat> and because um, it simply is impossible for the administration to do all those hearings in a timely way, sometimes you're waiting for years, and so many people say, you know what, it's worth it. Even if I won't be allowed to stay under these asylum laws, at least I'll be able to stay until I have my hearing to determine whether I'm here lawfully. So when people say they're here illegally, technically they're not. If they're waiting for their asylum hearing, then they're here lawfully. Okay, so for months and months, uh, Joe Biden, members of the House and members of the Senate have been trying to negotiate a fix to the immigration laws. A large element of it is to change the asylum laws to put rules around it. You can only come in in certain times, in certain places, in certain numbers, etc. Well, as you've heard me document many times before, and it's going to come up at the debate tomorrow night, um, when those negotiation fixes had been approved by the, the negotiators, including the most conservative guy, this guy Langford in Oklahoma, it was Joe Biden who said, forgive me, it was Donald Trump who said, no, to my minions in Congress, put a stop to this. Don't make these changes to the law um, because I want the issue. I don't want a solution to the problems to pass through Congress. Well, many people on the right, started saying, well, you can do it by executive order. You can do it by executive order. And Joe Biden correctly said, I can't do it by executive order. We know this because Donald Trump tried to do these things by sort of quote unquote executive order. And it was struck down by the courts because of the plain reading of the immigration laws. Well, Joe Biden, in a fit of exasperation and probably political expedience, said, the heck with it. I'm going to try also to do this by executive order to start limiting the number of people that can come and declare asylum, to start limiting the number, to closing down the border periodically. It has had the desired effect. It has reduced dramatically the number of people crossing over the borders, but it is manifestly illegal and he is being challenged in the court. So that brings us to today's Ask Anthony Anything, and it is um, from the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson put out a statement when Joe Biden said, I'm going to try to do these things by executive order, more or less daring the courts to stop him too, but for political reasons to say, I'm doing everything that I can. Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, said the following. Just two weeks ago, the president pretended to crack down on open border catastrophe by engaging in election year border charade. Now he's trying to play both sides and is granting amnesty to hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens. Now, this is a reference to something that Joe Biden did where he said that if you are married, uh, if you are a, an undocumented person, but you are married to an American citizen while you're waiting for that process to be fleshed out, we're not going to, um, we're not going to um, throw you out of the country. We aren't going to deport you. A little very different from these other people we were talking about. Um, but then he goes on to say, the president may think our homeland security is some kind of game that you can try for political points, but American people know this amnesty plan will only incentivize more illegal immigration. It's not really true. And endanger Americans. Proof positive Democrats plan to turn illegal aliens into voters. I truly expect this order, which is manifestly contrary to the Immigration and Naturalization Act, to be challenged and struck down in the courts. Well, it's that last point that I want to clap back at. Here is a chance that what Joe Biden is doing vis a vis saying we're not going to deport people who are married to American citizens. That might be struck down to the court by the courts. But the, the part that I want to talk to, to Speaker Johnson about is the idea of the things that Speaker Johnson, ahead of the legislative branch, ahead of the, the thinks that Joe Biden can change laws in a way that no one can accept the legislature. And this gets back to what all of this immigration debate ultimately comes down to. Periodically, the laws have to be updated. I am going to read you. You don't need to be a lawyer. I'm going to read you Section 1158, the asylum law uh, that is in the United States Code, the law of the land today. In general, any alien who is physically present in the United States or who arrives in the United States, parentheses, whether or not at a designated port of arrival, and including an alien who was brought to the United States after having been interdicted in international or United States waters, 
irrespective of such alien status, may apply for asylum in accordance with this section. Basically, it says, plain as day, if you're in the United States, you can apply for asylum. Now, there's, many, there's more provisions that, um, about what makes a legitimate asylum claim. But while you are waiting for those things to be adjudicated, you are here lawfully. So is Speaker Johnson wrong that he, when he says, I think the courts will strike down what Joe Biden is trying to do around the wives and spouses and husbands of American citizens? Maybe he is, because the courts have said repeatedly, you and Congress have to make these changes. But I would just point out that the same is true of executive orders around asylees in general. For months and months and months, years actually, Republicans have been saying, just do it with executive order like Donald Trump did it. Donald Trump tried to crack down on the asylum laws and the court stopped him because you have to change this law. At the end of the day, you have to change the laws by going back to Congress. And this mess that we have at the border, and it is inarguably a mess, is because of inaction by the legislature. So if Speaker Johnson wants to say, I hope the courts stop the president from keeping together married families, including of American citizens. He can't then say, I hope you ignore the rights of the legislature when doing asylum laws in general. That's the conflict. I don't know how this is going to be sussed out at the debate tonight, but if I am Joe Biden, I say to Donald Trump, these are the same laws you could not fix in 2019. You didn't fix them. I'm having trouble fixing them. Let's stand on this stage right now and shake hands on telling Congress, let's unify to try to update these laws rather than keep demagoguing on them. Um, I think right now what Joe Biden is doing by trying to do this by executive order is basically calling the bluff of the legislature. And ultimately, we'll be back here with the courts once again saying, no, you cannot take a clear letter of the law and change it just for political reasons. So that's Ask Anthony Anything. Speaker Johnson, if you're watching or listening, you can certainly write me and we can perhaps have this debate in person. Again, I want to thank Char uh, Charlie King for participating in the conversation at the top of this podcast. I am probably you're with me on this. I'm looking forward to this, this debate tomorrow night. I hope it winds up happening. Um, I wonder if you agree with my prediction at the end of the conversation where I didn't think there would be a second one, so this might be it. If you'd like to offer up some ideas for uh, guests on the show or an Ask Anthony segment, uh, it's wienerwabc at gmail.com, wienerwabc at gmail.com. I want to thank Eric for helping to produce this podcast and all of you for sharing it. If you think it's something people should hear about, I really do appreciate it. And this marks the end of The Middle Unplugged.